A Patriot's History of the United States. Chapter 8, Part 3, Fort Sumter. By the time Lincoln had actually taken the reins of the United States government in March of 1861, the Deep South had seceded. Although Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas, and others still remained in the Union, their membership was tenuous. From November 1860 until March 1861, James Buchanan still hoped to avoid a crisis. But his own cabinet was divided, and far from appearing diplomatic, Buchanan seemed paralyzed. He privately spoke of a constitutional convention that might save the Union, hoping that anything that stalled for time might diffuse the situation. He was right on one thing. The crisis clock was ticking. Secessionists immediately used state troops to grab federal post offices, custom houses, arsenals, and even the New Orleans Mint, which netted the CSA half a million dollars in gold and silver. Federal officials resigned or switched sides. Only a few forts, including Fort Moultrie and Fort Sumter, both in Charleston, possessed sufficient troops to dissuade an immediate seizure by the Confederates. But their supplies were limited. Buchanan sent the unarmed Star of the West to reprovision Fort Sumter, only to have South Carolina's shore batteries chase it off. Thus, even before the firing on Fort Sumter itself, the war was on, and whatever effectiveness little Buchanan, as Teddy Roosevelt later called him, might have had, had evaporated. The leading Democrat in his cabinet, Louis Cass, resigned in disgust, and Northerners of all political stripes insisted on retaliation. Ignoring calls from his own generals to reinforce the Charleston forts, Buchanan hesitated. His subordinate, Major Robert Anderson, did not. At Fort Sumter, Anderson and 70 Union soldiers faced South Carolina's forces. Fort Moultrie on Sullivan's Island and Fort Johnson on James Island straddled Sumter on each side, which sat in the middle of Charleston Harbor. Fort Johnson was already in southern hands, but Moultrie held out. Because Anderson could not defend both Moultrie and Sumter, he was forced to relocate his troops to Fort Sumter, transferring them on the night of December 26th. This bought Buchanan time for he thought keeping the remaining states in the Union held the keys to success. After February 1st, no other southern state had bolted, indicating to Buchanan that compromise remained a possibility. Upon assuming office, Lincoln wasted no time in assessing the situation. After receiving mixed advice from his new cabinet, the president opted to resupply the post, as he put it, to hold and occupy all federal property. He had actually a first thought to reclaim federal territory in Confederate hands, but at the urging of a friend, struck the clause from his inaugural address. He further made clear to the rebels that he would only resupply Anderson, not bring in additional forces. Nevertheless, the inaugural declared that both universal law and the Constitution made the union of these states perpetual. No state could simply leave. The Articles of Secession were null and void. He did hold out the Olive Branch one last time, offering to take under advisement federal appointees unacceptable to the South. Lincoln did not mince words when it came to any hostilities that might arise. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. We are not enemies, he reminded them, but friends the mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. Lincoln's cabinet opposed reprovisioning Sumter. Most of their opinions could be dismissed, but not those of William Seward, the Secretary of State. Still smarting from the Republican convention, Seward connived almost immediately to undercut Lincoln and perhaps obtain by stealth what he could not gain by ballot. 
He struck at a time in late March 1861, when Lincoln was absorbed by Warren's suffering from powerful migraine headaches, leading to unusual eruptions of temper in the generally mild-mannered president. At that point of weakness, Seward moved, presenting Lincoln with a memorandum audaciously recommending that he, Seward, take over, and more absurdly, that the Union provoke a war with Spain and France. Not only did the secretary criticize the new president for an absence of policy direction, but suggested that as soon as Lincoln surrendered power, Seward would use the war he drummed up with the Europeans as a pretext to dispatch agents to Canada, Mexico, and Central America to rouse a vigorous continental spirit of independence against the Confederacy. The president ignored this impertinence and quietly reminded Seward that he had spelled out his policies in the inaugural address and that Seward himself had supported the reprovisioning of Fort Sumter. Then he made a mental note to keep a sharp eye on his scheming Secretary of State. By April 6th, Lincoln had concluded that the government must make an effort to hold Sumter. He dispatched a messenger to the governor of South Carolina informing him that Sumter would be reprovisioned with food and supplies only. Four days later, General P.G.T. Beauregard got orders from Montgomery instructing him to demand that federal troops abandon the fort. On April 12th, Edmund Ruffin, the South Carolina fire eater who had done as much to bring about the war as anyone, had the honor of firing the first shot of the Civil War. In the ensuing brief artillery exchange in which Beauregard outgunned Anderson, his former West Point superior, four to one, no one was killed. A day later, Anderson surrendered, leading Jefferson Davis to quip optimistically, there has been no blood spilled more precious than that of a mule. Soon thereafter, the Upper South joined the Confederacy, as did the Indian Territory tribes, including some of the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole. Lincoln expected as much. He knew, however, that victory resided not in the state houses of Richmond or Little Rock, but in Missouri, Maryland, Kentucky, and Western Virginia. Each of these border states or regions had slaves, but also held strong pro-Union views. Kentucky's critical position as a jumping-off point for a possible invasion of Ohio by Confederates and as a perfect staging ground for a Union invasion of Tennessee, was so important that Lincoln once remarked, I'd like to have God on my side, but I've got to have Kentucky. With long-standing commercial and political ties to the North, Kentucky nevertheless remained a hotbed of pro-slavery sentiment. Governor Beriah McGoffin initially refused calls for troops from both Lincoln and Davis and declared neutrality. But Yankee forces under Grant ensured Kentucky's allegiance to the Union, although Kentucky Confederates simultaneously organized their own counter-government. Militias of the Kentucky State Guard, Union, and Kentucky Home Guard, Confederate, squared off in warfare that quite literally pitted brother against brother. Maryland was equally important because a Confederate Maryland would leave Washington, D.C. surrounded by enemies. Lincoln prevented Maryland's pro-slavery forces, approximately one-third of the populace, from joining the Confederacy by sending in the army. The mere sight of Union troops marching through Maryland to garrison Washington had its effect. Although New York regiments expected trouble, the governor of New York warned, that the first Zouaves would go through Baltimore like a dose of salts. In fact, a wide belt of secure pro-Union territory was carved 20 miles across Maryland. Rioting and looting in Baltimore were met by a suspension of habeas corpus laws, allowing military governors to keep troublemakers incarcerated indefinitely, and by the arrest of Maryland fire eaters, including 19 state legislators, when General Benjamin Beast Butler marked 1,000 men to seize arms readied for the Confederates and to occupy Federal Hill overlooking Baltimore during a thunderstorm, Maryland's opportunity for secession vanished. 
One of those firebrands arrested under the suspension of habeas corpus, John Merriman, challenged his arrest. His case went to the U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice and Marylander Democrat Roger Taney, who sat as a circuit court judge. Taney, seeing his opportunity to derail the union's agenda, declared Lincoln's actions unconstitutional. Imitating Jackson in 1832, Lincoln simply ignored the Chief Justice. In Western Virginia, the story was different. Large pockets of Union support existed throughout the southern Appalachian Mountains. In Morgantown, the grievances that the Westerners in Virginia felt toward Richmond exceeded those suffered by the Tidewater planters who were against the Union. A certain degree of reality set in. Wheeling was susceptible immediately to a bombardment from Ohio, and forces could converge from Pittsburgh and Cincinnati to crush any rebellion there. Wisely then, on June 19, 1861, Western Unionists voted in a special convention declaring theirs the only legitimate government of Virginia. And the following June, West Virginia became a new Union state. Let us save Virginia, then save the Union, proclaimed the delegates to the West Virginia Statehood Convention. And then, as if to underscore that it was the restored government of Virginia, the new state adopted the seal of the Commonwealth of Virginia with the phrase, liberty and union added. West Virginia's defection to the Union buffered Ohio and western Pennsylvania from invasion the same way that keeping Kentucky's geographical location protected Ohio. In a few politically masterful strokes, Lincoln had succeeded in retaining the border states he needed. The North had secured the upper Chesapeake, the entire western section of Virginia. More important, it held strategic inroads into Virginia through the Shenandoah Valley, into Mississippi and Louisiana, through Kentucky and Missouri, and into Georgia through the exposed positions of the Confederates in Tennessee. Moreover, the populations of the border states, though divided, still favored the Union, and three times as many white Missourians would fight for the Union as for the Confederacy, twice as many Marylands, and half again as many Kentuckians. Missouri's divided populace bred some of the most violent strife in the border regions. Missourians had literally been at war since 1856 on the Kansas border, and Confederates enjoyed strong support in the vast rural portions of the state. In St. Louis, however, thousands of German-American immigrants stood true to the Union. Samuel Langhorn Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, who served a brief stint in a Missouri Confederate militia unit, remembered that in 1861, our state was invaded by Union forces, whereupon the secessionist governor, Claiborne Jackson, issued his proclamation to help repel the invaders. In fact, Missouri remained a hotbed of rebel and pseudo-rebel resistance with more than a few outlaw gangs pretending to be Confederates in order to plunder and pillage. William Quantrell's raiders, including the famous Frank and Jesse James, and other criminals used the rebel cause as a smokescreen to commit crimes. They crisscrossed the Missouri-Kansas borders, capturing the town of Independence, Missouri, in August 1862, and only then were they sworn into the Confederate Army. Quantrell's terror campaign came to a peak a year later with the pillage of Lawrence, Kansas, where his cutthroats killed more than 150 men. Unionist Jay Hawkers, scarcely less criminal, organized to counter these Confederate raiders. John C. Fremont, the pathfinder of Mexican war fame, commanded the Union's Western Department. Responding to the Missouri violence, he imposed martial law in August 1861 invoking the death penalty against any captured guerrillas. Fremont further decreed arbitrarily that any slaves captured from rebel forces were emancipated, providing the pro-secession forces in the border states all the ammunition necessary to push them into the Confederacy. This went too far for Lincoln, who countermanded Fremont's emancipation edict while letting martial law stand. And we'll continue with the combatants square off in the next video. 
Thanks so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.